Welcome back to Impact Show. So excited today. My gosh, it's been a marathon of a day. This morning, we had Jin Lee, professor from Stanford University, the leading researcher of all things neurobiology and artificial intelligence in a packed room of over 100 leaders in Southern California. It was epic. With all the changes happening in the admin, healthcare, genomics, AI, she's like at the crescendo of opportunity. And with that, I'm so excited to have Ryan in my afternoon session. I'm actually doing two impact shows in the same day. And I'm here to talk to Ryan about his genius idea. And here we just interviewed somebody that's running a $100 million enterprise. And now we're interviewing someone who just started a company which I can almost foresee will be as big as Elvis and the work that Stanford's doing in AI. So. Ryan, I know a little bit about you. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Ryan Honore. Um, I was born and raised in Newport Beach, California. And right now I'm a high school student. I'm a junior. I'm 17 years old. And right now I'm the founder and CEO of Sensory AI. And basically what our goal is, is to be able to detect uh, wildfire in its incipient stage, uh, basically detect a fire when it's smaller than one foot by one foot, and basically be able to get firefighters there so soon and so quickly that by the time they get there, it's small enough for them to quickly just put it out and kind of just pose as just a nuisance to them. Right, right. That's amazing. And it's, it's so amazing, right? So like, I'm here in Newport Beach, and literally a week ago, I was in Zermatt, Switzerland with my family. We're going skiing. By the way, if you've ever been, I highly recommend it, Zermatt, Switzerland. So you fly into Zurich, you take a train, it's some of the best skiing in the world. And I check the Orange County Register every day, and I read this great article about Ryan and his fire innovation. And I've talked to a lot of my friends, Palmer, etc., about like, we are living in a world where fires are happening all around us. And most profoundly, what just happened in LA with $30 billion in losses. I mean, what a calamity, but what an opportunity as well to fix something that's so broken. And when I read that article, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to contact this guy and get him on the show and hear about his innovation and how he's been able to take a problem and actually resolve it. See, it doesn't take capital. It doesn't take age. It doesn't take experience and wisdom to be able to create the next badass idea that could turn into a billion dollar company, but more importantly, save lives, save industry, and help innovate with the tools that are right here in front of us. It's just putting those tools together. And any one of you can do that in your own business, your own life, your own industry. So I sent him an email as I'm getting on the gondola in Zermont. And by the time the gondola got off, he, he replies back. And you know, it's just stuff like that, right? And like reach out on LinkedIn. And the irony was I had actually met Ryan before, which I didn't even know. <laughs> and it turns out that him and his father were at the same house. In fact, I invited them at Rob Hutter's home in Powder Mountain. And they were there with their mutual friend, his friend Parker, whose father's my friend Craig Atkins. And that's how the good world works together. And so that made this even more interesting to me is to like figure out how we can get his great, great solution out to our world and get this thing from concept to reality, but also in the marketplace so it can help save lives. And this reminds me of Blake Resnick bring drones and a lot of other people that we interviewed early on in their, in their development and how so many of you got behind their product and helped them get exposed into the marketplace. So Ryan, I've done a lot of talking. Now it's your turn to unpack sensory AI. Tell us exactly what it is and how it works. Yeah, so basically it's a network of detectors and um, where they would be placed would be in high risk locations of wildfires. And those are chosen by um, the fire authorities and they're usually around like, for example, high voltage equipment and such because that's how a lot of fires are started. But usually they're in areas that we would call like the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And my whole network is connected via mesh networking, which basically allows it to need no infrastructure. So it doesn't need any external source of Wi-Fi, doesn't need any source of power. And all of my detectors um, have sensors that detect for the three main signatures of fire, which is heat, flame, and smoke. Mm -hmm. And then they, are also, they also have the capability to run artificial intelligence on the edge, which basically allows for sensor fusion 
so that my sensors and the artificial intelligence can work together to incre increase accuracy but also decrease false alarm. Right. And in the case of a fire, um, my detector would detect the fire and then send that information from detector to detector until it, until it eventually reached one of my detectors that have cellular capabilities. And that detector will then send a push notification or text message to the local fire um, fighters in mm -hmm. the local fire agency. Right. Um, and in that notification, they would get the longitude and latitude of the detector that detected the fire. And then also the direction in which my infrared camera or the infrared camera of the detector would be pointing in. Right. So they know specifically exactly where the fire is. So of those units, um, how far do each units have to be from each other to, to function? Like it's maximum capacity. Yeah, so we have tested and been able to um, separate two detectors from each other um, up to one and a half miles. Oh wow. While still um, being able to hold up those mesh capabilities. So mesh can communicate that far. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. It kind of reminds me of triangulation with cell networks and how cell sites work. And it seems like you're triangulating the signal to the fire department on the very beginnings of any sort of brush fire. It, it's, it's just so hard to believe with all the technology and all the modernization, especially in California, that someone hasn't come up with this. So tell me, how did this idea come? Like, like I mean, like, when did it come? I mean, you're so young, how much younger were you? And like, what was the precipice? What was that? that instant like moment you're like hey this is it and like how, how did how did that all come together yeah so it was actually five years ago so i was around 12 years old 11 12 years old and i was in um arizona in november of 2018 and i was actually there for a tennis tournament because i still play competitive tennis and i was there with my dad and during one of my breaks i saw on the tv there was this raging wildfire and there were hills and houses burning and you know as the average 11 year old kid I wasn't reading the text I was just looking at the, the pictures and videos and the hills that were burning looked just like the hills that were behind my house right so I called my mom to ask if she was okay because my mom wasn't with me and she was mm -hmm. because the fire ended up being in Palisades that was the devastating campfire oh, okay um and so I felt like a wave of relief and then I almost felt guilty like how could I feel relieved and happy and go on with my day while knowing that people are like escaping for their lives literally right. and they don't know if their house is going to be burnt or not and so i started to do some research and i realized that the reason why wildfires are such a big problem is that by the time firefighters get there or even know they exist the fire has already grown so much out of hand that it becomes so difficult to put out it's almost like they're just trying to right. keep the fire from progressing rather yeah. than actually like taking it down um, and one, one fact I actually found that was crazy was that um, the campfire had traveled 7.8 miles in just 45 minutes. Oh my gosh. Which I find is just insane. Um, so yeah, that's why I think early detection is just such a game changer. So you're 12 years old, you have this idea, but how do you take, even just by doing research, how do you take that and actually turn it into a physical form factor with technology and getting it to operate where, where did that come from? It, it was actually a coincidence. In my science class at the time, um, we had a project where we basically were told to make anything. <laughs> and I had decided to make like a heat sensor. And basically I connected a bunch of wires on a circuit board. And then I had like a little sensor. And then I took a hair dryer and then I blew the hair dryer on the sensor because it would create heat. There you go. And then like a light would turn on. Okay. And um, after this, um, I guess with a mixture from my passion from the campfire, I decided, what if I add two more sensors? So I added oh, okay. like a super simple smoke sensor, it barely worked. Yeah. Um, and an infrared sensor that also like barely worked. These were each like $2 or sure. something like that. And I was like, why not just make them all like high end? sensors so i replaced the circuit board heat sensor with like a two dollar sensor instead and i thought that was pretty cool and then obviously as my passion grew more and more mm -hmm. i started to improve my product more and more so i ended up adding like um 
a board with a pole that stood with a plastic thingy majig is the best way to right. basically explain it. Um, it was supposed to be for the wind speed and wind direction of the fire. And um, as my passion grew more and more and as time grew on more and more, I started to upgrade my product or my, it was just a project at the time. Sure. And then, yeah. And then there you go. Yeah. And then you had a fully operating prototype. <laughs> Pretty much, And yeah. then how do you take a fully operating prototype into an actual fire authority relationship? Like, how, how did you get on the map with fire authority? And congratulations to you, because that article Thank in you. the register was, was so well written by the journal. And, and it really went into depth on how Orange County has embraced you and how they're, they're actually debuting you into the marketplace. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So I had um, been doing a lot of science projects at the time and I had placed well in a science competition and then Chief Brian Fennessy, um, he's a fire captain at the Orange County Fire Authority, um, he actually emailed me saying that he was very interested in what I was doing. Right. And so he took me um, down to San Diego and we met with a lot of um, high-end um, scientists there, fire analysis scientists there. And they had actually told me that, they basically gave me a thumbs up on my idea. Oh, wow. And they said that the idea that I had been working with at the time could actually work if I were to keep working at it. And obviously at the time, this was years ago, so this was about two years ago, so um, it was still my, what I had working with at the time was still in its very beginning stages, but they saw my vision and yeah. they knew that if my vision were to be executed successfully, they sure. knew it could really be made into something that could work, so. Can you, can you show us a little bit about how Sensory AI works and what, what, it, what it is and yeah, maybe just sure. kind of for our audience? So these are what the final, final productized version of my detectors would be. So the hardware would be inside of here and there would be a gas sensor on to, um, inside of here. And then there would be, there could be solar panels on here as well. Mm -hmm. It's almost like customizable. Okay. So depending on the geography of yeah. where fire authorities would like to place it or maybe the budget of the fire sure. authorities, they could choose whether they want to add a camera as well, they want to add solar panels. Um, and then for example, this one has the uh, smoke sensor in here and then it has a camera right here on the top. So actually, if I pop in this battery, Mm -hmm. the camera will kind of turn around like this right and then it would eventually right. see a fire and then that's when the whole system would fire what's off. the energy source on these so these work with just two double a's mm -hmm. um and then you can also add a solar panel in as well right because I, I would think like sustainable solar would would make a lot of sense and yeah. You know, you're in fire prone regions, so having solar uh, powering this would be a great solution. And so the stage of your business right now is in prototype. You have a relationship built with the fire authority. What's next for you? What's next for Sensory AI between now and the next six months to year? What's important to you? So we have done, we did our very first deployment of one detector just a week or two ago. And we're planning on deploying four more by the end of March this year, so five in total. And then we're gonna be deploying 20 more um, by September of this year, so it, would be, it will be 25 in total. Okay, fantastic. And so it detects the fire, it sends a signal to the fire station, and then from there they deploy resources to take something that's this small, you used an analogy earlier to cancer. Can you can you describe that again? Yeah, so basically I th the way I like to look at fires is like cancer. When you catch them in their very early stages, it's almost just like a nuisance. You can put it out, deal with it, go on with the rest of your day. But when you catch a fire or cancer in its late stages, like stage four cancer, it becomes a much bigger problem to deal with. And it's almost like so-so if your operation is gonna even be successful. Right. So that's really why the early detection is such a big deal because if you can get firefighters there in within just minutes of the fire starting, it's 
boom, done, firefighters go home, get a good night's right. rest. So you're 17 now, you started this when you were 12. What, what is, what, what is the reason that you keep going, like, instead of giving up? Like, like, there's a, thousands of entrepreneurs that are watching this, and they have their sensory AI, but they, they can't get it going for some reason. Like, what advice do you have for them on, on, like, not giving up? I would say that they should just keep on working at what they've got with as long as possible and not give up just because they're not seeing any immediate success. Because for example, for me, I didn't see really any for form of success until this first deployment. But I guess you could say even when until the Orange County Fire Authority had contacted me and even that was three or four years after working at it. Right. So I think that it's really important to keep on working on it for as long as possible and not just give up because they don't see any form of immediate success. Awesome. Well, with that, uh, there's a great example of another impact show. And uh, Ryan, we're really grateful for you Thank and you. Uh, wish you continued success with Sensory AI. And I, I've gotten pretty good at, at predicting um, entrepreneurs, technologies, companies, and at the beginning and the end of all these stories, it's all about relationships. And for all of you, remember that. So if you think about all the relationships that Ryan talked about in this story, okay, from his mom to his father, to the fire chief, to all those people that have helped him, and now us, right? That's what also takes things from concept to reality. So I'll leave you with that thought. Ryan, we wish you continued success and thanks Thank for being you. on the show. Thank you for having me. All right, me. cool.